Always a good start. So my name is David Henson. I'm known as the Slide Presentation Man. Good afternoon or morning or evening or wherever you are on the planet. Good day to you. So here is a typical online debate about using slides in presentations posted by someone I know in a uh, in a Facebook group. PowerPoint or Keynote? Terrible tool that's taken over too many presentations? Question mark. What's your view? Well, this got a lot of response, as you can see at the time. And I decided to keep my, my powder dry at the time because I was delivering a talk to this very group, quite similar to today's talk, just a few days later. A talk in which I, as the slide presentation man, could give everyone the benefit of my authoritative, well, opinion. Yeah, it's just an opinion. I know from experience of talking to people about slides that it's a subject that everyone's got an opinion about. And when I tell people I'm the slide presentation man, they usually like to give me their opinion. And more often than not, they react in one of two ways, which is either don't talk to me about slides. I never use slides. Or I'll tell you all about slides, at which point they uh, kindly proceed to tell me their opinion about slides as they uh, as they promised they would do. So firstly, let me give you my take on when you should and shouldn't be using slides. One of the most helpful things you can you can uh, use to determine when to use slides is a sample of rice. And you're probably thinking, what the heck has a sample of rice got to do with presenting with slides? Well, let me explain. They are a pair of acronyms that I use. Now, sample, I'm not going to go through that today. If you really want to know what it stands for, just put it in the put it put it as a question and I'll tell you later. But I'm going to get down to a more granular level, if you'll pardon the pun, with rice. And RICE stands for Reinforce, Illustrate, Clarify, and Explain. So let me give you some examples of these four types of things. If you've got a point that you're making in your presentation that needs to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a visual, then it's a good candidate for firing up your laptop, opening up PowerPoint, and producing the slide. So, for example, if I was to tell you that 47,000 dogs were abandoned in the UK in the past 12 months, that would make you feel, hopefully, very sad. But if I was to tell you that 47,000 dogs were abandoned in the UK in the past 12 months with this slide on the screen, well, that kind of reinforces the message, doesn't it? That, having that picture on the screen. You've got this sad little dog with his doleful eyes staring out as his owner deserts him. By the way, no animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. So that's an example of an example of reinforcement. What about illustration? Well, if I was to talk to you about the quality of the gold braid in the painting of the curtains behind um, Henry VIII in Hans Holbein's masterpiece, then what are you thinking? You're thinking, Dave, show us a picture. Show us what you mean. So now I can talk to you about the quality of the painting, the brushwork in that gold braid in the curtains. And you can see it for yourself. You can see what I'm talking about. So that's an example of illustration. What about um, clarification? Well, here we have Earth and Jupiter. And if we shrink and expand them to their relative sizes, you can see that the Earth fits into Jupiter's great red spot three times over. So that clarifies a message. You could also say that it illustrates it as well. So there are some crossovers between these points. And finally, explanation. Here is a very simple explanation of the electricity generation process going from the wind turbine through to the step-up transformer. Third stage is where it goes across the grid. The fourth stage is into the step-down transformer. And finally, it's made available to your home. So that slide is an example of um, explanation. explains a complex subject in very simple ways. But here's the point. If you're making a point in your presentation that doesn't need to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a visual, then don't be afraid to go blank. Not you, by the way, the slide or the screen. If you're going to go blank in Zoom or on a meeting such as this, then you, for, for a period of time, then you should probably stop sharing your screen. But I'm going to move on um, to the next slide, so I won't stop sharing my screen. But it means that the audience then focuses on you as the speaker rather than the slides that are on the screen. So what about the use of slides when telling a story? Do you leave them 
or do you leave it to or, or sorry do you use them or do you leave it to people's imaginations i like this quote i much prefer stories on the radio to stories on the tv because the pictures are so much better it's a really nice quote there isn't it but if you're telling a story for example that mentions a specific person then showing a picture of that person can help to enhance the story. So, for example, this is um, a picture of a, a lady. This is Deborah Henley, a, a friend of mine and a, sto a storytelling specialist who tells a story about her grandmother and talks. Um, and in her talk, she shows us this picture. And not to be outdone on the family album front, this is a picture of my lovely dad who passed away a few years ago riding a horse through his granddad's orchard sometime in the mid-1930s. Now, I will, um, I'll come back to him later on. But I agree, if you're telling a story where you want people to use their imaginations, then there is no need to use slides. In fact, there is a need not to use slides, in my opinion. Let me illustrate what I mean. Here's a short line from a story. She stood on the balcony, deep in thought. The view that met her eyes had become wearily familiar. Now, you've all got this image in your head, your, your head now of a, of a woman standing on the balcony looking out at a view, haven't you? But what kind of image have you got in your head? Is it something like this? Or possibly something like this? If that quote had been within the context of a fuller story, then you'd have known what type of scene it would be referring to. But your imagination can paint the scene in your mind, and the use of slides can only interfere with that. So I think using slides in storytelling depends on whether it's a specific person or place or whether you want to leave it to the audience's imagination. So I hope that's, I hope that's helped in the slides versus no slides debate. But there's another debate that often crops up too, and one that is even more divisive. And I'm not talking about Brexit for those of you in, uh, in Britain. Now I'm talking about PowerPoint, PowerPoint versus Keynote, the two main presentation programs. Now there are others, you, you, there's Prezi, Google Slides and so on, but PowerPoint and Keynote are the two most widely used. Um, and if one is, if, if you ask me which one is best, I'm gonna say PowerPoint because I use PowerPoint, I know it inside out, and most of my clients use PowerPoint, but I know there are many people who prefer Keynote on the Mac. So who's right? Well, I think we're all wrong. PowerPoint and Keynote are just tools and can both be misused as well. And they often are, by the way. <laughs> um, and the way that they're designed, particularly PowerPoint, encourages you to produce rubbish slides. I've often heard the phrase, PowerPoint is rubbish. And I've, I've, I've been very polite in using the word rubbish here, but uh, I'm sure you can think of many other words that might be used instead. But I'm going to be very harsh here, ladies and gentlemen. It's not PowerPoint that's rubbish. It's the people that use PowerPoint that are rubbish. Think of PowerPoint and Keynote as just um, a repository for your content, and you're responsible for that content. What you're seeing today is a PowerPoint presentation. A lot of this was done directly in PowerPoint that I'm presenting you to, to, to you today, but some stuff was brought in from outside. So given that PowerPoint and Keynote are simply presentation tools, what's the best software to learn to produce really good presentations. Well, did you notice about the four slides that I used to demonstrate rice? They have one thing in common. What is it? They all use images, don't they? So here's the thing. I think the best software for, um, or techniques to learn, if you want to be good at slide presentations, is image editing software. Get good at images and it will transform your presentation. So why use images on slides? Well, first of all, there's less room for text, which is always a good thing in my in my opinion. It means you cut down the amount of room that people can put bullet points on their slides. Secondly, it's more fun. It's more fun for you as the presenter to produce slides with, with um, I was, gonna, I was gonna say with bullet points on, I mean with images on, and it's more fun for the audience. But most importantly, it's more memorable and effective. So it's more likely to get your message across to your audience. But before we go on and look at some of the things that you can do to help produce really good images, there are five things to avoid when using images. The first thing I think you should avoid when using images is cliches. 
things like, oh, we've hit our targets. Are we going to put a bullseye on the slide? A swooshing graph. And of course, the ubiquitous handshake. If you can't think of anything else to put on a slide, put a handshake on the slide. But even worse than that, I think, are images like this, this kind of corporate men around the desk with their very bright white teeth. Um, and, and I think the thinking behind this kind of slide is that the presenter's thinking, well, I'm presenting about my business to people who are in business. Therefore, I'll put a picture of people in business on the slide. To me, this is the visual equivalent of bullet points and should be avoided at all costs. The second thing to avoid is clip art. Now, I've got nothing against good quality cartoons, but I'm talking about this kind of thing. This is, uh, you might have got away with this in the 1980s and 1990s, um, but it has no place in the 21st century. And of course, these 3D you, uh, 3D stickmen, which have become, have become very ubiquitous. Um, some people seem to like them, but not for me. And the third thing I think you should avoid is low resolution images. And in fact, it's actually quite hard to find low resolution images these days anyway. Most images that you find on stock libraries or ones that you've taken yourself are usually high resolution. But of course, you need to avoid uh, low resolution images. They just look really woolly and unprofessional. The fourth thing to avoid is copyright theft. So if you type public speaking into Google Images, you'll get a whole bunch of images that appear. And of course, you could easily lift any of those images off of there and put them in your presentation. But it's a bit like stealing a packet of digestive biscuits from the supermarket. You can do it, you can get away with it, but of course you shouldn't do it, should you? And there's really no excuse for it these days because there are so many sources of free and very cheap images on the web. Two of the stock libraries that I use that are free are Pixabay and Unsplash. I also use Shutterstock and more lately Adobe Stock. They're not free, but they are very cheap, four or five pound for images. And on Shutterstock, they have over 300 million images. So you should be able to find something that uh, that you can use. And also Creative Commons. Now, Creative Commons is an image license, which, which allows you to use the images either completely free of charge. So in other words, that the images that are on Pixabay and Unsplash have a free Creative Commons license, or with maybe an attribution to the photographer. And there are various Creative Commons licenses. And one of the advantages of Creative Commons or public domain images is that images like that picture of Henry VIII that I showed you earlier are in the public domain, certainly in the UK anyway, because the uh, the law in the UK states that once the author or the painter in this case has been dead for 70 years, the work of art goes into the public domain and then can be used. And of course, if you can't find images on stock libraries, then you could try taking the photograph yourself. This is the photograph that I took. It's taken many years years ago. For those of you that know London, it, if that image was taken nowadays, you'd have the tallest building in Europe, the Shard, in the background. So uh, I should probably get it updated. But I just love that sunset that uh, occurred. I think it was about 2003. So it was quite a long time ago. The fifth thing I think you should avoid is what I call small images. It's when people do this. They put an image on the slide and they put a load of white space, or in this case, blue space around the image. So do something like this instead, where you've got the image filling the screen um, and the title put on the image in a nice creative way. So the five things to avoid when using images are cliches, clip art, low resolution images, theft, or copyright theft, and uh, small images. So if those are the five things to avoid, what should we be aiming to use in our images? Well. The first thing that the image needs to be impactful it needs to have um, an effect on the uh, on your audience it could be it doesn't have to be colorful i mean nothing wrong with using monochrome images but again color adds impact and memorability to your to your slides it should be quirky you could say this image is quite quirky different by which i basically mean not cliche as i said earlier don't use cliches in your images if you can add a touch of humor to the images then again makes them more memorable you could say that this image that's on the screen now is quite amusing and that's of course you suffer from uh, chlorophobia or the fear of clowns in which case you probably want me to move on fairly quickly but most important of all it should be relevant now you can apply the rice principle to images as well does the image reinforce or illustrate or clarify or explain the point that you're trying to make. So PowerPoint and Keynote can do a lot of stuff with images. I'm gonna quickly demonstrate a few of the techniques that I regularly use in PowerPoint to great effect. 
Um, don't have the time to actually show you how to do them, but a lot of these things are covered in my blogs and on LinkedIn and my regular posts on the Slide Presentation Man Facebook page. And of course, I cover a lot of these techniques in my workshops as well. So the first thing is recoloring. Bear in mind, you can do this in, in, uh, in PowerPoint. So you've got these nice colorful images, uh, this nice colorful image, and you can change the contrast and recolor it. And then, of course, once you've done that, it makes a nice background for, for text to go on, on top of it like that. So recoloring, changing brightness, changing contrast, all those sort of effects can be done easily within PowerPoint. Another thing you can do within PowerPoint is you can cut images out. Now, this image is quite nice. It's a picture of a ballerina. But if we cut the ballerina out and put her toes at the bottom of the image, it looks a lot more classy. And you've got some basic cutting out tools in PowerPoint, which you can do. This was actually cut out in PowerPoint. Um, and it, it looks much more effective. This image as well, this is uh, this guy looks quite um, menacing, doesn't he? But if we cut out his face and just move him across to the, uh, to the side of the screen, suddenly he looks a lot more threatening. And of course, one of my favorite images that I use, this is my Wimbledon prize money slide. Um, and on this slide, the ball or the balls that appear on the slide and the tennis player are all cut out. And if they weren't cut out, if they had a background on them, they would look totally unrealistic. So you have to cut out the images to make the whole thing realistic. Next thing you can do in PowerPoint is is this. This is actually really simple. It's a five minute job, even though it looks like it's been done in a, a professional animation studio. So you've got this space shuttle flying in around the planet Mars. You can bring 3D models into PowerPoint. So in this case, I've put a, a starry background on. I've got the 3D model of Mars and of the shuttle, which are available as stock images within PowerPoint. And I brought them in and I've used PowerPoint's morph transition to morph between one slide and another so on the first slide the shuttle was off the top of the top of the slide and on the second slide it ends up in the position you can now see and in between the two slides using the morph transition it will then morph those two images together and the same thing with the planet rotating around slightly so morph is a really useful technique to use and 3d images can also enhance your presentation another technique to use especially when you've got an image that's very long horizontally or very long vertically is to use a panning technique like this so you can see this is my this is my website and a website page in its entirety is quite a a long kind of vertical image but by panning it from bottom to top i can show the whole of that web page and the same thing applies to this slide you can see that the sky is a long horizontal image and i pan it across from left to right on the slide and again, what I'm doing here is I'm using the morph transition to morph the balloon from bottom left to top right. And, of course, cutting out the balloon image so that it looks photorealistic. Another useful image technique is masking. So here we have um, another free Creative Commons image. This is the middle triptych of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthy Delights. And if we focus in on a detail of that picture, you can see that under the disc there is a face and it's a self-portrait of Hieronymus Bosch that is snuck in under that disc and the technique that I've used there in PowerPoint is a masking technique to to pick out that face so that you can see it more clearly and all I've done there simply is to put a rectangle on top of the large image on the right hand side then a circle over the rectangle where the face appears then punch the circle through the rectangle to make a new shape with a hole in the middle Again, this can be done in PowerPoint and then made it semi-transparent. So the painting still shows through, but the face, of course, shows through uh, much more much more brightly. And the final image technique is more of an image concept than a technique, and that is to use the rule of thirds. So uh, this was first posited by John Thomas Smith in 1789, and he suggests that by breaking an image down into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, and then placing the elements of that image along those thirds, it gives the image more interest and more edge. And I kind of agree with that as well. I think that does work. Um, but also it helps um, in PowerPoint because you can use it as a handy placeholder for a title. So in this case, you've got the bird on the right-hand third, you've got the beach on the or the shoreline on the bottom third, and then a title in that handy little space at, uh, at top right. 
So whilst PowerPoint and Keynote can do a whole lot of stuff, it's worth learning how to use image editing software, such as Photoshop, Fireworks, or PixLR, P-I-X-L-R, um, even if at a basic level, because it will allow you to have more control and, even, and be even more creative. So I want to cover quickly some of the things that most image editors will allow you to do. So an image editor such as Photoshop or Fireworks will give you much more control and accuracy when it comes to cutting out images. So I said that PowerPoint can cut the images out, but if you were trying to cut out this picture here of Isaac Newton, you couldn't do it in file in um, PowerPoint, sorry, because there's not enough contrast between the foreground and the background. So I would always use something like Photoshop in preference to, to PowerPoint. And so what I would do is I would cut around the image using the marquee tool, as you can see here, and then delete the background, and then save the image in PNG format, which allows you to have transparent backgrounds, a fourth channel, which is transparent. And cutting out images allows you to produce scenes in PowerPoint that are really effective, as you've already seen from the tennis player and the balloon. This image of Newton was used in a presentation that I did for a cruise ship speaker who was speaking about the search for longitude. And in his original presentation, he presented me with this really crude GIF image of Newton sitting under the apple tree. So what I did is I produced this. So the scene uses various cutouts uh, with Newton having a light bulb moment, even though, of course, light bulbs haven't yet been invented. And the slide sequence uses five separate cutout images. The tree branch is cut out. The falling apple is cut out. Newton is cut out, as you already know. Newton's mouth is cut out. So when he says the word ouch, it's like a little bit of a Monty Python mouth going open and closed. And, of course, the light bulb is cut out. And all of it appears on this background of the, of the field. So using an external image editor to cut images out can be can be really effective. You've also got various filters that can be applied. So you can see here the Mona Lisa in various guises using the filters that you can apply in uh, in Photoshop or Fireworks or other image editors. Um, of course, these should be used very judiciously and not used uh, willy nilly. And the other thing that you've got within most image editing programs is the ability to use layers. So here's an image that I produced some uh, a few years ago, and it uses layers to produce a very realistic looking image. So the first layer is of the guitar player standing there playing the guitar. Now you may be wondering, how did I get a shot of the guitar player from underneath? Well, I didn't. The guitar player is actually laying down on a white sheet. Um, so the, the so a little bit of um, image trickery there being used. Then the second layer is the effects pedal, simple effects pedal all by itself. The third layer are the cables, which I laid out and photographed. And the fourth layer is the shadow that appears under the guitar player's shoe and the sh or under the guitar player's sh shoes in both cases, one of the, um, of the pedal and one of the cable. And when they're all put together, you can see it produces this effect. So it's a you can just build up layers of images and that's a really useful thing to be able to do. So before I go on to my final point, I want to just um, give you a couple of goodies. I have uh, my 10 top tips for slide presentations that will wow your audience. And also using slides online and online presentation tips. I mean, hopefully we're going to get back in the room very soon. I know I'm looking forward to doing that. But uh, if you're presenting online and you want some tips, you can go to tspm.uk slash bigview2. Uh, TSPM stands for the slide presentation man. So it's very easy to remember or scan that QR code and you will automatically be sent those top tips for presentations and the online presentation tips. And I also uh, have a book, which is your slides suck available at tspm.uk slash book. And as I mentioned earlier, I also run workshops, either corporate workshops or open workshops. You can find out more information at TSPM dot uk slash workshop i also produce slides so if you want me to produce and design presentations i can do so the one that you're seeing building up on the screen now is one that i produce for uk power networks to do with smart charging of electric vehicles and finally i am on linkedin so if you'd like to connect with me on linkedin just look for dave henson slide presentation man so my final point 
A few years ago, I told my two little sisters that if they didn't love the Christmas card that I was sending to them, I would run around the block naked. Their reaction was that they were going to say they didn't like it anyway, just to call in the dare. So you'll remember this picture from earlier, and this is my dad on the horse that I showed you earlier, riding through his granddad's orchard. And what I did is I took this into Photoshop, I recolored it, and I added a suitably Christmassy background and made the card look like this. And both my sisters thought it was brilliant. They were unable, they were able to say that they they, they were unable to say so that they didn't love the card. And I was able to keep my clothes on. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear. So that's an example of what can be done when using image editing programs. So I hope that you've enjoyed today's talk. A final point is that becoming an image expert is in many ways more important than becoming an expert in PowerPoint or Keynote if you want to create effective and engaging presentations. I'd like to thank you for coming along today, and I hope you found that useful. And here, finally, are my contact details. I'm going to stop sharing my screen to find out whether there have been any questions in the uh, in the panel as we've been uh, in the chat panel as we've been as I've been presenting. I probably forgot to say at the beginning that you can put questions in the um, in the chat panel. So um, I don't know, Cal, if you've seen any questions come through, or if anyone's got any questions. Yes, we have a few questions. Of course, feel free to ask questions now. And I already sent you in the chat Big View's information and also David's information. So feel free to visit his website and contact him on LinkedIn. So we had a few questions. Uh, the first one was about um, the sample you showed and people wanted to know in the beginning. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah. Well, sample, uh, um, sample is the list of questions that um, that you can use to find out about your presentation. Uh, and it's what, I, it's, it's, it's what I use when I'm asking clients about the presentation. So S stands for subject. What's the subject you're talking about? So most of us know what subjects we're going to talk about. A stands for audience. So who are you speaking to? Because obviously that makes a big, big difference to the message that you're going to get across. And M stands for message. So what is the message that you want to get across to your audience? What do you want them to, to feel or think or do um, as, as a result of your talk? And the P and the L are slightly more prosaic. P stands for place. Where are you presenting? Is it in a large um, conference hall around a boardroom table, maybe on Zoom? Um, and L stands for length. Is it a five-minute talk, half an hour, one hour, uh, whatever? So, And then the E stands for execution, because then you decide how you're going to execute your talk based on the answers that you got to those questions. And it may be at that stage that you decide whether or not you're going to use slides. And that's the point I normally move on to rice and say, but I have another acronym that helps you to determine when you should and shouldn't use slides. So that's a very brief, uh, a very brief <laughs> summary of sample. You can contact David to hear more. Um, <laughs> okay, we have, we have a specific question about dreams. <laughs> I don't David, what slides should I use about dreams? Dreams are my passion. Dreams. Ah, I, I, I'm used to getting some questions on uh, on talks, but that's a, I've never had one about dreams. But what slides <laughs> are you using about dreams? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I do, Ali. What I do if I'm if I'm um, if I want to find an image for a particular point that I'm making, I will do a search on Google Images, even though I can't use the images that are on there, just to give me some inspiration. If I can't think of something, I'll use I'll do a search to give me some inspiration. Um, and then some, I'll, I'll often find something. Oh, yeah, that's what I want to use. Picture of clouds or something. I don't know. But um, And then you can look up on your chosen stock site, whether that's Pixabay or Unsplash or maybe a paid site like Shutterstock or Adobe Stock, and, and find a suitable image. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it's you come up with an idea straight away, and other times you just need a little bit of inspiration. And that's what, that's what the Internet's there for, isn't it? Great. So I hope uh, Ali it worked it helped you and we have a question from ron is asking if he can also use short videos and not only images yeah i think ron yes i mean video you can bring video into powerpoint you can do it in three ways you can either link the video um you can play it online or you can embed it now i would always advise embedding it um the only downside with embedding it is if you've got to give the presentation to someone else and they're playing on a slower machine and then you've got it on then the video might struggle a little bit but i always do that because if you're relying on um like a youtube video for example and you're presenting in someone else's uh, space 
then you need to make sure you've got a robust internet connection to make sure that video plays. But I would say, yeah, I mean, video again, use it, use it carefully because you don't want the video to take over your presentation if you're if you're if you're the presenter. But certainly, yeah, if it if it serves the purpose, if it reinforces or illustrates or clarifies or explains the message you're trying to get across, then I'd say use it. Yeah. Okay, great. We have another question from Ali. There it is. Really simple, Ali. Actually, really simple to do. Um, so I, what I did is I found a starry background. Probably found. I can't remember where I found it now. Probably on Pixabay. And I imported that onto the slide. And then when you when in PowerPoint, if you go to Insert 3D Models, and one of the options is I can't remember whether it's from stock images or something or something like that. You've got a, a whole bunch of 3D models in the PowerPoint. They will depending on the complexity of the 3D model, they will increase the file size of your PowerPoint. So be a little bit careful when using them. But when you drag the 3D model, when, or when you insert the 3D model into PowerPoint, you'll see it's got a little handle in the middle, which you can drag around to, to, to rotate it in all different directions. Um, and you can do that on the slide. And the way to do the morph transition is to create your first slide with the 3D model. Then you duplicate that slide, Control D or right click on it and duplicate it. And then on the second slide, you move that 3D model into its new position. So you move it and you can twist it around. And then you apply the morph transition to that second slide. And you'll see that the, like with the space shuttle, it was off the slide on the first or this side, wasn't it? Off the uh, slide on the first slide. And then it came flying in across the slide onto the second one. Really very simple to do, but obviously also very effective. OK, great. Uh, we have a question about recording. This is recorded, like I said, so feel free to watch it again uh, on Big View's Facebook page or YouTube channel. You can do that. Uh, we have another question from Osama. Do you believe I can ask support from some graphic designers to help me? Yeah, I think if you've got a graphic designer, that's great. It's a good start. Um, I would say that you also need to make sure that someone is expert in communications because getting the message across is, in, in my experience, you need to make sure that the slides are congruent with the message you're trying to get across, which is why I also say and quite clearly in my talks that if you're making a point where you don't need to use visuals, then don't use visuals. Get the audience to focus on you telling a story or doing whatever you do on stage or on screen. Um, some people think I've got to have a slide on the screen all the time but you don't you know sometimes it gets in the way um so i think graphic design or graphic designer is a good start but also a communications expert as well i think you need someone who can do both of those things okay thank you um i think we don't have any more questions so i want to thank all of you for coming and of course you david for an amazing presentation thank you Ciao. You're getting compliments from, from the audience right now <laughs> in the oh, chat. Thank you, audience. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much and see you in the next workshop. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.